Today, let's have a discussion regarding the proofs. So let's have an introduction to proof. In this discussion, we will introduce the notion of the proofs and describe methods for constructing proofs. So when we say a proof, it is a valid argument that establishes the truth of a mathematical statement. A proof can uh, use the hypothesis of the theorem, if any, and then it could be, uh, you can also use axioms, assumed to be true, and previously proven theorems. Using these ingredients and rules of inference, the final step of proof establishes the truth of the statement being proven. So in our discussion, we move from formal proof of theorems towards more informal proof. The arguments we introduce uh, to show that statements involve propositions and quantified statements are true were formal proof, where all steps were supplied and the rules for each step in the arguments were given. However, formal proof of useful theorems can be extremely long and hard to follow. In practice, proof of theorems um, designed for human consumption are almost always in informal proof, where more than one rule of inference may be used in each step, where steps may be skipped, uh, where the axioms being assumed and the rules of inference used are explicitly stated. Informal proof can often explain to human why theorems are true, uh, while computers are perfectly happy producing formal proof using automated reasoning system. The methods of proof discuss, uh, that we are going to discuss are important not only because they are used to prove mathematical theorems, but also for many applications to computer science. Um, these applications include verifying that computer programs are correct, establishing that operating systems are secure, making inferences in artificial intelligence, showing that system specifications are consistent, and so on. Consequently, Understanding the techniques used in proof is essential both in mathematics and computer science. So let's start with um, some terminologies. So for this, terminologies are frequently used in our discussion pertaining to proof. So, formally, a theorem is a statement that can be shown to be true. In mathematical writing, the term theorem is usually reserved for a statement that is considered at least somewhat important. Uh, less important theorems sometimes are called propositions. So, theorems can also be referred to uh, uh, facts or results. Uh, a theorem uh, may be universal quantification of a conditional statement with one or more precise and a conclusion. However, it may be uh, some other types of logical statement, as the examples later in our discussion will show. Uh, we demonstrate that a theorem is true with a proof. A proof is a valid argument that establishes the truth of a theorem. The statements used in a proof can be uh, can include axioms or also called postulates, which are statements we assume to be true. So the premises, if any, and the theorem are previously proven theorems. Axioms may be stated using primitive terms that do not require definition, but all other terms used in theorems and their proof must be defined. The rules of inference, together with definitions of terms, are used to draw conclusions from other assertions, uh, trying to gather the steps of a proof. In practice, the final step of a proof is usually just the conclusion of the theorem. 
However, for clarity, we will often recap the statement of the theorem as the final step of a proof. A less important theorem that is useful in the proof of other results is called lemma, the prola, prola, uh, plural of this lemma is called lemmas or lemata. Complicated proof are usually easier to understand when they are proved using a series of lemmas where each lemma is proved individually. A corollary is a theorem that can be established to get uh, established directly from a theorem that is being proved. A conjecture is a statement that is being proposed to be a true statement, usually on basis of some partial evidence or heuristic argument or intuition of an expert. When a proof of a conjecture, conjecture is found, the conjecture becomes a theorem. Many times, conjectures are shown to be false, so they are not theorems. Okay. So let's have understanding how theorems are stated. Uh, before we introduce methods of proving theorems, we need to understand how many mathematical theorems are or how many mathematical theorems are stated. Um, many theorems assert that a property holds for all elements in a domain, such as integers or real numbers. Uh, although the precise statement of such needs to include universal quantifier, the standard convention of, in mathematics is to omit. For example, in the statement, uh, if x greater than y, where y, x and y are positive real numbers, then x squared is greater than y squared. This statement really means for all positive real numbers x and y, if x greater than y, then x squared is greater than y squared. Furthermore, when theorems of this type are proved, the first step of the proof usually involves selecting a general statement of the domain. Subsequent steps show that this element has the property in question. Uh, finally, universal generalization implies that the theorem holds for all members of the domain. Okay, so let's have uh, methods of proving theorem. Um, proving mathematical theorems can be difficult. To construct proof, we need, e we need all available ammunition, including a powerful battery of different uh, proof methods. Um, these methods provide the overall approach and strategy of proof. Understanding this method is a key component of learning how to read and construct mathematical proof. Uh, one, we have chosen a proof method. Uh, we use actions, definition of terms, previously, uh, previously proved results, the rules of inference to complete the proof. Okay, so we will also assume the usual axioms whenever we prove a result about geometry. When you construct your own proof, be careful not to use anything but these actions, definitions, and previously proved results as fact. So to, to prove a theorem of a form Let's say for all x, uh, for all for uh, let's say for all x, uh, the quantity p of x implies q of x. Our goal is to show that p of c implies q of c is true, where c is an arbitrary element of the domain, and then apply universal generalization. In this proof, we need to show that the conditional statement is true. Because of this. We now focus on method that shows that the conditional statements are true. Recall that P implies Q is true unless P is true but Q is false. Note 
Uh, note that to prove the statement P implies Q, we need only uh, show that Q is true if P is true. Okay, so in the discussion, we'll give the most common techniques of proving conditional statements. Later, we will discuss methods of proving other types of statements. So uh, we will develop a large arsenal of proof technique uh, that can be used to prove a wide variety of theorems. So when you read proof, you will often find the word obviously or clearly. These words indicate that steps has been omitted that the author expects the reader to be able to fill in. Unfortunately, these assumptions is often not warranted and readers are not all uh, not at all sure how to fill in the gaps. We will uh, astutely try to avoid these words and try not to omit too many steps. However, if we included all steps and in proof, our proof would often be excruciating long. So let's start with direct proof. A direct proof of a conditional statement P implies Q is constructed when we when the first step is the assumption that p is true subsequently uh, subsequent steps are constructed using rules of inference with the final step showing that q must also be true so a direct proof shows that a conditional statement p implies q is true by showing that if P is true, then Q must also be true. So that the combination of P true and Q false never occurs. In the direct proof, we assume that P is true and use axioms or definitions and previously proven theorems together with rules of inference to show that Q must also be true. We will find that direct proofs of many results are quite straightforward with a fairly obvious sequence of steps leading from hypothesis to the conclusion. However, direct proofs sometimes require particular insight and can be quite tricky. The first direct proof we present here in this uh, discussion are quite straightforward. Later, uh, you will see some are less obvious. So we will provide examples of several different direct proofs. Okay, before we give the first example, uh, we need to define some terminology. So for example, the terminology, um, the integer n is even if there exists an integer k such that n equals 2k. And n is odd if there exists an integer k such that uh, n equals 2k plus 1. Note that every integer is either even or odd, and integers is both even and odd. Uh, no, uh, no integer is both even and odd. Uh, two integers have the same parity when both are even or both are odd. They, uh, they have opposite parity when one is even and other is odd. Okay, so let's have an example. Uh, example one, give a direct proof of the theorem. If n is an odd integer, then n squared is odd. So we already defined what is uh, what is odd and what is even. So in this case, we are going to have uh, if n is an odd integer, then n squared is also an odd. So for our solution, so in this case, okay, uh, note that this theorem states that for all, let's say, for all n of the proposition P, okay, P 
which n implies q of n okay where in this case our p of n is you have n is an odd integer okay and we also have okay our q of n must be uh, n squared is odd okay so as we have said we will follow the usual convention in mathematical proof by showing that p of n implies q of n and not explicitly using universal instantation uh, to begin a direct proof of of this theorem we assume that the hypothesis of this conditional statement is true namely we assume that n is odd so by definition of an odd integer it follows that n is equal to 2k plus 1 because it's odd where k okay is some oops is some integer okay so we want to show that n squared is also okay is also odd so we can square both sides and the equation so remember that we have n is equal to 2k plus 1 so if we are going to square both sides what we have is n squared is equal to the quantity uh, to 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 uh, which is equal to if we are going to uh, separate okay you have uh, re uh, remove common monomial factor we have uh, 2 times 2k squared plus 2k okay plus 1 in this case remember this is n squared so remember that n to be odd should be 2k plus 1 so in this case since we have n squared is equal to the quantity 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1 so in this case we could say we could really see here that 2k plus 1 okay can be written as this way where you have the factor you have the common factor 2 and then you have plus 1 and this k okay is this one okay so by definition of an odd integer we can conclude that n squared is an odd integer it is uh, more than twice an integer so consequently we have proved that if n so in this case therefore if n is odd then n squared is an odd integer. Uh, it should be odd integer here. Integer. Okay. So if n is odd integer, then n squared is an odd integer also. So in this case, we have proved it's a very straightforward proof that if n is squared uh, if n is an odd integer then n squared is also an odd integer so clearly we could have here that n squared is an odd integer okay so let's have the second example so give a direct proof that if m and n are both perfect squares then mn 
is also a perfect square. An integer a is a perfect square if there is an integer b such that a equals b squared. Okay. So for our solution, uh, to produce a direct proof of this theorem, we assume that the hypothesis of this conditional statement is true. Namely, we assume that M and N are both perfect square numbers or perfect square, uh, yes, perfect square numbers. So for our solution, in this case, since we are using direct proof, we assume that M and N are perfect square. Okay. By definition of a perfect square, it follows that there are integer s and t such that uh, m equals s squared and n equals t squared. So the goal of the proof is to show that mn must also be a perfect square when m and n are uh, looking ahead we see how we can show this by substituting you have s squared for m and t squared for n okay into so you have uh, m N. So this tells us that mn is equal to s squared t squared. Hence, uh, mn uh, is equal to sstt. Okay, which is equal also to st times st which can be uh, shown as st quantity squared. So take note that when we say a perfect square number or a perfect square, okay, let's say a is a perfect square if it can be expressed as b squared. So since as we have here that if m and n are both perfect squares, then mn or nm, Okay, is also a perfect square. So in this case, we have mn is equal to the quantity st squared. So here, if our a is mn, then our b here is st. So we have now okay, transformed the mn equals the quantity st squared as into the form of a equals b squared so uh, using commutati uh, commutativity and associativity of multiplication so by the definition of a perfect square it follows that mn is also a perfect square number because it is the square of st which is an integer so we have proved that if m, therefore here we could now say that if m and n are perfect square, then m times n is also a perfect square. Okay. So let's have so let's have this one. Um, direct proof leads from the premise of a theorem to the conclusion. They begin with the premises, continue with a sequence of deduction, and, and 
end with the conclusion. However, we will see that attempts at direct proof often reach dead ends. We need other method of proving theorems of the form for all x of the quantity p of x implies q of x. So proof of theorems of these types that are not direct proof, that is, do not start with premises and end with a conclusion, is called indirect proof. So an extremely useful type of indirect proof is known as proof by contraposition. Uh, proof by contraposition make use of the fact that a conditional statement P implies Q is equivalent to its contrapositive uh, not Q implies not P. This means that the conditional statement P implies Q can be proved by showing that its contrapositive not Q implies not P is true. In a proof of contraposition of P implies Q, we take not Q as a premise. And using axioms, definitions, and previously proven theorems together with rules of inference, we show that not P must follow. So we will illustrate proof of uh, by contraposition with an example. So this example shows that proof by contraposition can succeed when we easily or we cannot easily find a direct proof. So let's have an example. Prove that if n is an integer and 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. So first, let's try to attempt a direct proof. So to construct a uh, direct proof, we assume, okay, for our solution, so for direct proof, we assume that 3n plus 2 is an odd. Okay, so this means since this 3n plus 2 is an odd, then we could have 3n plus 2 can be equal to 2k plus 1. For some integers, k, okay, k is some integers. So we can use this fact that um, we can use this fact to show that n is an odd. So in this case, we see that 3n okay, 3n plus 1 is equal to 2k. But these but there is, uh, but but there's there's does not seem to be a direct way to conclude that n is odd. So because our attempt in at a direct proof failed, the next uh, proof that we are going to use is the proof by contradiction. So a uh, contraposition rather. So, the first step in a proof by contraposition is to assume that the conclusion of the conditional statement if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd, okay, is false. So, namely, that n is even. So, in this case, so in this case, let's say that n Is even. So, by the definition of an even integer, n is equal to 2k for some integers. Okay. So, substituting 2k for n, we find that 
3n plus 2 is equal to 3k. Ah, wrong. So we have uh, 3 times 2k plus 2, which is equal to 6k plus 2, which can be also expressed as 2 times 3k plus 1. So this tells us that 3n plus 2 is even because it is a multiple of 2. Okay. So, and therefore, because this is, because uh, 3n plus 2 is, uh, is even, therefore it's not odd. So, this is the negotiation of the premise of the theorem. So, because the negotiation of the conclusion of the conditional statement implies that the hypothesis is false, the original conditional statement is true. So, in other words, since we have... Now, take note that in our given... We have stated in the given that 3n plus 2 is odd. But in our solution, we have here that if n, if n is even, therefore 3n plus 2 is also even because it is multiple of 2. Okay, so in this case, 3n plus 2 okay, is even. This is from our given. This is from the given. Because we have here 3n plus 2 is odd. So here we have 3n plus 2 is even because in this case if n is even then 3n plus 2 should have a multiple of 2. Therefore this is false. Why this is false? Why we could say that this is false? Because it is already given in the in our uh, example that 3n plus 2 should be odd. Therefore, we succeeded the proof by contraposition. So, in other words, because we have 3n plus 2 uh, is even implies false statement. Therefore, we have proven that if 3n plus 2 is odd then n is odd okay next let's have this number four prove that if n equals a b and uh, where a and b are positive integers then a is less than or equal to square root of n or b is less than or equal to square root of n. So, for our solution, because there is no obvious way of showing that a less than or equal to square root of n or b less than, less than or equal to square root of n directly from the equation n equals a b for a and b are positive integers, we attempt a proof by contraposition. So our first step in the proof by contraposition is to assume that the conclusion of the conditional statement, take note that our conditional statement, okay, you have if n is equal to a, b, where a and b are positive integers. then a less than or equal to square root of n or b less than or equal to square root of n. Okay, so we are going to assume that this is a false statement. Okay, so take note, the first step in a proof by contraposition is to assume that the conclusion of the conditional statement is false. 
So take note that this is our conclusion. So let's assume that this is false. That is, we assume that uh, this one, the statement, okay, a less than or equal to square root of n or b square less than or equal to n should be false. Okay, using the meaning of this junction together with the De Morgan's law, we see that this implies that both uh, you have a less than or equal to square root of n and b less than square uh, less than or equal to square root of n are false. Okay, so this implies that a is greater than or greater than square root of n. Okay, and b is less than a square less than square, greater than rather greater than square root of n. By this, we can multiply these inequalities together using the fact that if uh, s is greater than 0 but less than t and u is greater than 0 but less than v, then uh, you have s, uh, s u is less than t v. So we can now obtain that a b is greater than square root of n times square root of n, which is equal to n. So this shows that AB is greater than n. And this implies that AB is not equal to n. Now, this contradicts to the given that n should be equal to AB. Because here, n is equal to AB. However, if we have here, if a is less than or equal to square root of n and b is less than, or less than or equal to square root of n are false, this implies that a is greater than square root of n and b is greater than square root of n. Because these are greater than square root of n, we can now multiply these two inequalities. So a, b is greater than square root of n times square root of n, which implies n, so or which is equal to n. So in other words, ab is greater than n, which is ab is not equal to n. So it contradicts to the given that n is equal to ab. So because the negotiation of the conclusion of the conditional statement implies that the hypothesis is false, the original conditional statement is now True. So by proof of contradiction, we all, we now succeeded to give the proof. Okay, we have proof that if n is uh, equal to a b, where a and b are positive integers, then a is less than or equal to square root of n, or b is less than or equal to square root of n. So that's it. Uh, right here. Therefore. If n is equal to ab, where a, a, and b are positive, are positive integers, then a less than or equal to square root of n, or b is less than or equal to square root of n. Okay. So let's have math another methods. So uh, we can quickly prove that a conditional statement p implies q is true when we know that p is false because p implies q must be true when p is false. Consequ consequently, we can show that p is false when we have a proof called vacu uh, vacuous proof of the conditional statement P implies Q. So VQ's proofs are often used to establish special cases of theorems that state that the conditional statement is true for all positive integers. For example, the theorem of a kind uh, for all n uh, of P of uh, P of n, where P of n is a propositional function. Okay. 
So, let's have this example. Show that the proposition P of 0 is true for P of n is if n greater than 1, then m squared is greater than n. And the domain consists of all integers. So for our solution, note okay, that p of 0 okay, is um, if 0 is greater than 1, then 0 squared should be greater than 0. Okay, so we show that p of 0. Uh, uh, p of 0 using a uh, vicious proof. Indeed, the hypothesis 0 greater than 1 is false. So in this case, we could now say that 0 greater than 1 is false. Okay, so this tells us that, okay, this tells us the p of 0, okay, is automatically Because p greater than uh, zero greater than one is false. Okay, so the fact that the conclusion of this conditional statement zero squared greater than zero is false, okay, is irrelevant to the truth value of the conditional statement because the conditional statement with a false hypothesis is guaranteed to be true. Okay, so. Okay, we can also quickly prove a conditional statement P implies Q if we know that the conclusion Q is true. By showing that Q is true, it follows that P implies Q must also be true. A proof of P implies Q that uses the fact that Q is true is called trivial proof. So, trivial proof are often important when special cases of theorems are proved. And in mathematical induction, which is a proof technique that to be discussed. Okay, so let's have example. So let P of n be if a and b are positive integers with a greater than or equal to b, then a raised to n is greater than or equal to b raised to n, where the domain consists of all non-negative integer integers. Show that P of 0 is true. So the for this for our solution, oops. So the proposition p of zero, okay, is if um, a greater than or equal to b, then you have a raised to zero is greater than or equal to b raised to zero, okay, because uh, because a, so here, let's say, a raised to 0 is equal to b raised to 0, which is equal to 1. The conclusion of the conditional statement, if p, uh, if a greater than or equal to b, then a raised to 0 is greater than or equal to b raised to 0 is true. Hence, this conditional statement, which is p of 0 is true. This is an example of trivial proof. Note that the hypothesis, which is the statement A greater than or equal to B, is not needed in this proof. So in this case, okay. So in this case, we could now say that uh, P of 0 is Okay. Okay, so let's have method of uh, method of proving theorems. So let's have proof by contradiction. So suppose we want to prove that a statement P is true. Uh, therefore, suppose that we can find a contradiction Q such that not P implies Q is true. So because Q is false, but not P implies Q is true, we can conclude that not p is false, which means that p is true. 
So, how can we find a contradiction Q that might help us prove that P is true in this way? So, because the statement uh, R, um, uh, because the statement R and not R is a contradiction whenever R is a proposition, we can prove that P is true if we can show that uh, not P implies the quantity R and not R is true for some proposition R. So proof of this type are called proof by contradiction. So because the proof by contradiction does not prove a result directly, it is another type of indirect proof. So we uh, provide uh, examples of proof by contradiction. So let's have the first example. So let's say, show that at least four of any 22, day, 22 days must fall on the same day of the week. So to, uh, to solve this, to show, so for our solution, okay, let okay, P be the proposition, okay, at least for twenty uh, tw four of twenty two days, okay, um, fall on the same day. Of the week. Okay, so suppose that uh, let's say that not P is true. So this means that uh, at most three of the 22 days fall on the same day of the week. Because there are seven days in the week, this implies that at most 21 days could have been chosen. So as for each of the days in the week, at most three of the chosen days could fall on that day. So this contradicts the premise that we have 22 days under consideration. Okay, that is if our statement Okay, if, so let's say R, okay, is the statement that 22 days are chosen, then, okay, we have Ah. Okay, so we have uh, shown that uh, not, not P implies the quantity R and not R. Okay, so consequently, we know that P is true. We have proved that at least four of 22 chosen days fall on the same day of the week. Okay, so let's have okay, example number eight. Proof that square root of two is irrational by giving proof by contradiction. So in this case, so let's have, let P be the proposition. So in this case for our solution, let P be the proposition okay you have the square root of 2 is irrational is irrational oops irrational okay okay to start the proof of contradiction we suppose that not p is true okay note that uh, 
not p is a statement uh, it uh, because if we are going to state it in sentence it's not the case that the square root of 2 is irrational which says which implies okay that which implies that square root of 2 is rational we will show that assuming that not p is true leads to a contradiction so if square root of 2 is rational so if this is rational there exist integers a and b with square root of 2 equals a over b because that's the definition of rational number so if that would be the case that square root of 2 is a rational number then square root of 2 is equal to a over b where b is not equal to 0 and a and b have no common factors so let's take here a and b have no common factors no common factors okay so here we could uh, this implies that a and b should be uh, in the lowest terms so here we are using the fact that every rational numbers can be written in lowest terms so because a uh, because square root of 2 equals a over b then squaring both sides of the equation can be done so here we could have uh, square root of 2 equals a over b so if we square both sides this implies that 2 is equal to a of a squared over b squared okay hence since uh, you have 2 equals uh, a squared over b squared we could now say that 2 b squared is equal to a squared so by definition of an even integers, it follows that a squared is even. So we must use the fact that if a squared is even, a must also be even. So furthermore, because a is even, by definition of an even integers, we could now say that a is equal to 2c. For some, okay, here, for some integer c. Thus, because uh, we have this statement, we can now say that 2b squared is equal to 4c squared. Okay, so by dividing both sides of this equation by 2, it gives us, if we are going to divide this one by 2, it gives us b squared is equal to 2c squared so by definition of even this means that b squared is even again using the fact that if the square of an integer is even then the integer itself must be even so we conclude that b must be even as well so we have now shown that the assumption that not b and uh, not p leads to the equation square root of 2 equals a over b where a and b have no common factors but both a and b are even that is 2 divides both a and b so note that the statement uh, that the statement that the square root of 2 equals a over b where a and b have no common factors means in particular that 2 does not divide a and b so because our assumption of not p leads to the contradiction that 2 divides both a and b and 2 does not divide a and b not p must be false so in other words because here we could say here that our a is even and b is even okay we could say here that a 
A and B are even. Now, take note that when we say even, there is a factor of 2 there. But take note that our A over B should have no common factors at all. But if A and B are given, or are even rather, it implies that there is a common factor 2 in the A and B. So in this case, we could now say it contradicts to, the, to our assumption that not P is true. Okay. It implies that not P is false. So this statement is false. Okay. So by that, we could now say, by the proof of contradiction, we could now say that the square root of 2 is irrational. Okay. So proof by contradiction can be used to prove conditional statements. In such proof, we first assume the negotiation of conclusion. We then use the premises of the theorem and the negotiation of the conclusion to arrive at a contradiction. So the reason for such proof are valid rest on the, uh, on the logical equivalence of P implies Q and the quantity P and not Q implies false. So to see that these statements are equivalent, simply note that each is false in exactly one case, namely when P is true and Q is false. So note that we can rewrite the proof by contraposition of the conditional statement as proof by contradiction. If a proof of P implies Q by contraposition, we assume that not Q is true. When we show that not P must also be true, to rewrite the proof of contraposition of P implies Q as a proof by contradiction, we suppose that both P and not Q are true. Then we use the steps from the proof of not Q implies not P to show that not P is true. This leads to the contradiction P and not P, com uh, completing the proof. So... Let's have another example. So, given, give a proof by contradiction of the theorem. If 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. So here, for our solution, let P be our statement 3n plus 2 is odd. Odd. and let our Q okay, to be the statement N is odd. So to construct the proof by contradiction, assume that both P and not Q are true. So we have P and not Q is true. Okay, so that is we assume that 3n plus 2 is odd and that n is not odd. Okay. Because n is not odd, we now we know that it is even. Okay. So here we could now say that n okay, take note that. We have Q is not at, so not Q, okay. This is, okay, we have uh, N is even. Now take note that both P and not Q is true. Now, because N is even, there is an integer K such that N equals 2K. This implies that 3n plus 2 is equal to 3 times 2k plus 2, which is equal to 6k 
plus 2 which again equals to 3 up 2 times 3k plus 1. So because 2n, a 3n plus 2 is the statement, okay, uh, is our, uh, because 3n plus 2 is 2t. Take note. Now, take note that this is 3n plus 2 is equal to T, where T is our 3K plus 1. Okay. And 3N plus 2 is even. Okay. Note that the statement 3N plus 2 is even is equivalent to the statement not P. Because an integer even if and only if it is not odd. Because both P and not P are true, we have now contradiction. So this completes the proof by contradiction, proving that if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. So let's uh, put it into writing. Now take note that we have the statement, take note that from this statement, 3n plus 2 is odd, which is true. Now, the not p would become our 3n plus 2, which is even. Where this came from? Here. 3n plus 2 equals 2p where t is 3k plus 1. Now, if because 3 plus 3n plus 2 is true, how it how it it, that, it it means that if p is true, how come that not p is also true? Take note that if p is true, it implies that not p is false. So there is now contradiction. So P and not P should not be the same. Okay. This should not be the same statement. We have true statement, false statement. So in this okay, implies contradiction. So since there's a contradiction happens, this completes the proof by contradiction. So in other words, since they contradict with each other, we can now say that if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd number. Okay. So... Take note that, uh, if we go back to our previous, take note that uh, we can also prove by contradiction that P implies Q is true by assuming that P and not Q are true and showing that Q must be also true. So this implies that not Q and Q are both true, which is a contradiction again. So these observations tells us that we can turn a direct proof into a proof by contradiction. Okay. So let's have proof of equivalence. So to prove a theorem that is a biconditional statement, that is a statement of the form P if and only if Q, we show that P implies Q and Q implies P are both true. The validity of this approach is based on the tautology the quantity P if and only if Q, if and only if the quantity P implies Q and Q implies P. So prove, so in this case, let's have an example. Prove that the theorem if N is an integer and N is odd if and only if N squared is odd. So the solution, okay, this theorem has the form, okay, for our solution. So this theorem have P if and only if Q. Okay. 
where our P is N is odd and our Q is N squared is odd. So as usual, we do not explicitly deal with the universal quantification. To prove this theorem, we need to show, okay, show that P implies Q and Q implies P are true. So we have already have this uh, example that P implies Q is true and Q implies P is also true. So because we have shown that P implies Q and Q implies P are true, we have shown that the theorem, okay, from the previous examples, okay, we all we already have shown that P implies Q is true. And Q implies P is also true. So in other words, we already have uh, we already have shown that both P implies Q and Q implies P are true. So the theorem is now true. So therefore, okay, if N is an integer, then N is odd if and only if n squared is odd. Okay, so that ends our presentation.